you know, academics are by nature, you know, we have questions. And my first question is, so really? The only conference on the African American blues legacy in the United States? In a country who would have no 20th century music without the blues? And nobody can figure out they should be talking about it, thinking about it, asking questions about it, learning about it, teaching about it. That's our job. Our job is you know, figuring out how to educate people about things to make them better human beings and better citizens and better participants. We teach the most obscure things on earth in the academy. And we defend it. Well, you know, I do have to know how the letter T as a typeface changed across centuries. And it's very important. We're going to have a major in it. Freedom of inquiry, that's what we're about. But the blues legacy can't find a university other than this one since 2008 to sponsor an annual or biannual conference on one of the most significant musical forms, but more importantly, one of the most rich sort of uh, anchor forms to explain and understand black life in the West that we have. But we don't have any academic interest in it. We barely have any historical analytical interest in it. And, and that's, I think that is the question that I want to talk about today. And I want to unpack that problem both as a, a possibility but also as a, as a problem. So the question is sort of how can this be? If the blues as a point of origin runs through nearly all of American music, it's the unifying principle for jazz, R&B, gospel, rock and roll, and hip hop, despite people who like to separate hip hop off into its own universe. It suffuses Broadway, Tin Pan Alley, Bluegrass. How can something so generative, so powerful, so full of the spirit, and more importantly, as Cornel West has so brilliantly put it, and pretty much he puts everything well, so that's kind of a redundant statement, but that blues is the hope in the face of catastrophe. How can something so powerful, so important, that generates a narrative of hopefulness, not always hopeful, but hopefulness in its last iteration, in the thing that it leaves you with, how can it be that something that provides so much hope in the face of catastrophe can be so marginalized, so understudied, so under understood? The power and beauty of the blues, but not just the blues, truth be told, of all African American music and culture, is a project in how to affirm the soul and how to heal under conditions of constant re-injury. How do you affirm the soul? How do you heal yourself and others around you? How do you develop a template around healing when the wound is reopened over and over again? It's one thing to know you're in healing, right? And it's one broken leg, you got a cast, you're laying down, you're cool. But if everybody's breaking your leg 24 seven, you need a different kind of medicine. You need an ongoing medicine. You need a way to think about that process. And the blues in particular is really top shelf medicine for chronic trauma. It's, it's really top shelf medicine for chronic trauma. And as a deep resource for this catastrophic level of, of suffering, it has really produced a, a certain kind of joy, not joy in the traditional sense that we use in America of sort of just an absolute happiness uninterrupted, but the sheer fact that you can access something pleasurable and affirming and community producing in the face of a consistently re-breaking leg, not broken leg, re-breaking leg in the active present tense, is the joy. The joy is how do you access possibility when it's actually not right there in front of you. So the blues, it seems to me, answers a fundamental question, which is where can I put this pain so I can keep going on and find hope in it? Where can I put this pain so I can keep going on and find hope in it? Now, you would think I'd be very hopeful based on this, because you know what could be more hopeful than the blues hoping against hope and creating a sense of possibility under these conditions? But I actually have some worries. And the state of the blues are actually giving me the blues. And I don't mean the state of the music. 
That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the state of our understanding about the blues, the way we study the blues, the way we study all black culture, the way we study anything that black people give the world actually worries me a lot. And it worries me because we're not, it seems to me, able to confront some fundamental things about ourselves. And because we can't confront some fundamental things about ourselves as US citizens, as people who've been bequeathed a legacy of American history that is complicated at best, makes it hard for us to really love and give and appreciate and share the blues in the right way. So the blues has moved around the world. Everything, pretty much everything African Americans have given the world has moved around the world with great alacrity and speed and often great profit. Um, but I'm not so sure that all of that sharing and giving and celebration and joy is part of a full understanding of black people's lived experiences. And so I'm left with a concern which is not limited to the blues. And I'm hoping you'll understand that part of what I'm doing here is talking about the blues. But what I'm really talking about is something that the blues represents, right? Um, and, and, and so what I'm worried about is that, just to keep it very simple, that America loves black music and culture, but I'm not sure it loves black people. Right. And I don't mean to impugn anybody's personal love of anybody, just let's get clear. Many of us love each other tremendously against great odds from all backgrounds, across all the parameters and lines and barriers that get set up. And I am not challenging that, I'm all for the love I don't care what you, purple, green, yellow, three legs, one, I'm all for that. But I'm not sure as a whole the United States has made any effort to clarify what it means to love black people in the state of history of crisis, suffering, and ongoing trauma that's been generated. And that continues to happen. What that means is that if we don't actually understand the history of black people and love them, you can't really love the music and culture right. You see, that's really the problem. If you don't understand and really empathetically attach and really connect to and compassionately grasp the full depth of the ongoing trauma and suffering, it doesn't mean you gotta cry and lay down and fall in the street, because the blues actually helps you avoid that. <laughs> right, I mean, the lesson is get up and let me tell you a story about how to survive this. But if you can't attach to that experience, if you can't feel an empathetic sense of grasp of the depths of it, then you can't love it right. It, it is not, it's not an intention that's the problem. It's a reality, it's a circumstance. It's a, it's a, it's a blind spot that the, that the way we understand race in America gives us. So we're, we're, in, a, we're in a crazy moment right now where I call it, now I gave a lecture here and had a great conversation with a, a different group of the members of the community. Um, I had uh, a conversation about how we can understand race in an era when we claim to profess that the best thing to do is not to see it at all. I find this very perplexing, I have to say. <laughs> and I'm, I've studied colorblindness in a variety of different venues and there are a lot of different ways to think about it. But what comes through all the way around is that there's a drive to imagine that at this historical moment, despite all the evidence to the contrary, we think we can solve a problem that you can only understand by looking at the way race works, not capitulating to narrow boundaries, not agreeing that race is the only thing we should do, but that you have to account for it to make sense of it. You have to account for it to change it. You have to see its work and its operations to figure a way out. But what we've done instead is claim that by not acknowledging the way privilege works and the way discrimination works based on race, that we're gonna fix it. We're gonna actually go blind so we can see. There's a blues song in there, and if I had any skill set whatsoever, I would write a blues song about color blindness. I know I need your help though, because really it's not, yeah, I mean, you got, you're, gonna have to, you're gonna have to help me with the lyrics. I'll give you a couple ideas, but I need somebody else to write the lyrics, because there's something in there. I guess something like, I'm so blind, that's why I can't see, right? I mean, really, I'm so colorblind, that's why I can't see race, but I'm working on it, I'm gonna I'm come up with something. 
So we're in an era where black culture itself, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about hip hop because as Gil so graciously said, clearly that's one of my levels of expertise, but I do also study 20th century black culture as a whole, and hip hop grows out of those experiences, particularly post-civil rights era black life. But we're evolving into a moment where the society is actually just as fascinated and obsessed with whatever the youthful generation of black music is, because that's where the obsession starts. It's not just black music as a whole. It's the generational relationships that matter. And yet have no idea that it's a black cultural artifact or that it comes out of a black cultural experience. Not only a black cultural experience, but primarily and significantly. So what we have is an appreciation for black culture without knowing what black culture is or that it is black culture. And that is really the, the, the kind of blind spot that leads us into insane understandings. And I was gonna tell this story later, but I'm gonna tell it now, um, which is that um, you know I teach a big lecture class on hip hop and I teach other courses on black culture in the 20th century. Um, but one time at one of the schools I've taught at over the years, will remain nameless because I, I think I do see two or three cameras, so I will not be naming any names. But anyway, at some school in my past, a room full of students, predominantly white, I teach at predominantly white institutions, and even if every black student on campus came to my class, my classes would still be predominantly white. Those are the numbers we're talking about. They don't all come because they're all majoring in engineering so they can actually get a job because they know how hard it is to get a job even with a degree as a black person. So they don't, they're like, I'm, I'm good with hip hop. I'm already good. <laughs> like, I have a degree in hip hop. They're like, Gil, we were philosophizing. We're straight. We got our own degree system working out. So anyway, after the first lecture, I'm explaining the course, and I'm saying, here's what we're going to do, and we're going to start here. And you know, I'm the Vanna White of ideas. You know, I'm just like <laughs> showing them all the letters. And um, that's Wheel of Fortune, for those of you who do not watch this geriatric show that I sometimes attend to. Anyway. And I'm showing them all, you know, blah, blah, blah. And this is what we're going to do. It's like a map, a road map. It's the first week. You know, you got to warm them up and here's what's going to happen. Here's the syllabus. Back of the room. Excuse me, are you going to actually argue in this semester that are you going to say and make the claim that hip hop is black music? And I wish right then I was a short story writer because. I cannot begin to describe to you how confused I was by the question first. I'm like, what do you mean? Are you upset about that? Or you think that's not true? Or you think, like, what are you actually asking me? So, well, hip hop's not black. And I, I thought, oh my God, it happened. I'm like, it happened to the music everybody thought was so black it could never happen. Right? It's happened to every music before, every single black music. And here it was happening to the most overtly, excessively, narrowly ghettoized, racialized, produced music you could possibly come up with. I mean, how much more black could hip hop be? What would it have to do? I mean, if I wanted to say I want a music that is so black nobody could steal it and claim it isn't black, I would make hip hop. <laughs> I mean, it's got enough racial stereotype in it to signify blackness right away. You don't even have to be really black. You just have to be stereotypically black, and you're straightened out. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I mean, I'm joking, but I'm not. And yet, here we are with some very intelligent, highly educated at a competitive university, as yet unnamed, making this claim that I, and was mad at me. But wait, he was angry with me. He was angry with me because he felt excluded by that fact. Not welcomed in to a tradition that he's entitled to participate in with a position of respect and parity and understanding and equality. No, he wanted to own it without having to deal with the racial consequences of what it means to pay attention to black life. He wanted to own it and got mad because I interrupted the project. I interrupted him because I knew what I was talking about. He couldn't actually win that argument, so he dropped the class. That day, I can check online. You know, that's the thing about computers. <laughs> now, what made me sad about that was that I wasn't going to exclude anybody. 
This is like the issue with the blues. Nobody's excluded, but you can't ignore the gift giver. You can't act like the gift giver's not present and that your role is so important that it doesn't matter who gave the gift. You don't know where the gift came from. It just sort of showed up. And this is what we have bequeathed to ourselves as a nation. We've bequeathed this logic to ourselves. And in the era of colorblindness, we've done it at a level much more pernicious much more pernicious because what's beautiful about the first, say, 40 or 50 years of the blues is that non-blacks who participated, whites and others, had to do very dangerous race line crossing work to participate. And so there was a sense in which one had to at least partially grapple with the reality of what racist structural America meant. But now colorblindness has led us all to believe that we're past that and that there is, in fact, no structural racism, and that we can extract the gifts of a given culture and a history, and then at the same time appreciate them without any self-reflection on what it is we're doing and what that work does. And what that ultimately does, it seems to me, is really it harms everyone because it cheapens the, the love gift but it also makes racial comedy, racial, and I don't mean comedy with a D, I mean comedy with a M-I-T-Y, racial understanding, racial getting along, true understanding and transcendence, and all of us working in the spirit of social justice and anti-racism, it makes that much harder because we're not understanding the actual conditions that we're living in. And we're not understanding the role of music and culture as a sustaining life force, right? as a medicine for trauma and a gift to the world at the same time. So what we have that happens in academics, in journalism, in research and other places is a kind of extraction process, like the way we treat natural resources. We extract the music, we extract the lyrics, we extract the artists, we fetishize. This happens in hip hop all the time. You know, individual happens in the blues, happens in R&B, happens in jazz, happens in gospel, happens in <sighs> rock and roll. It happens in every darn genre that at one point or another was primarily the bailiwick of people of African descent. May, they may not be now. <laughs> that happens. That's also part of the history. People tell me, do you think hip hop's ever going to be mostly white? I'm like, hmm. <laughs> I don't know what the rhymes will be about. <laughs> But it will be. <laughs> so if you can't avoid this extraction process, what happens is all of the richness of the genre and what the meanings are about become universalized without the value and significance of the particular. So of course you have to do both. The value of the particular is to say, listen, I mean, the value of the universal is to say we're all together. We are on this earth and we are actually tethered to one another more than ever. And if we don't figure that out, we're in a world of trouble. But we're, also, we're not in this world in the same way. And we're not on the same level vessel and we're not on the same kind of circumstances. And how one group of us act has a deep impact on the others particularly those with more power, whether it's economic power, whether it's deep religious power, whether it's gendered power, class power, racial power. So those choices become very important. But when we extract, we decontextualize. All of that history falls away. So we read in isolation. We imagine the gifts and the genius of an individual, and we don't understand the suffering from which they come. That drives the entire logic of what they're saying. It's not sort of a background biographical fact. It's a cultural richness. So I was just uh, listening to a few lyrics before I came here, and I uh, was reminded of B.B. King's very famous line, nobody loves me like my mama, but she might be jiving too. <laughs> now that's a universal worry on one level. Some of us have very troubled mamas. You don't have to be black to have a troubled mama, right? That's not a black thing. A lot of people got troubled mamas. But there's something about that possibility, right, that black people have to live with all the time. Basically, what you think you know for sure is what this is saying. You actually don't know for sure. 
because you can't trust that this world as you know it is as stable as even the love of your own mother. Because the world has made it clear that there's no kind of violence that is too great, no kind of explanation and justification for mistreatment that can't happen. People come up with all kind of cockamamie explanations for things that normalize black marginality. It's, it's actually surreal if you really think about it. And to understand this lyric only as an individual story, as an amazing story of suffering or as an amazing story of one person's wondering about whether or not he or she can trust his or her mama, puts in the backdrop, renders invisible what the consciousness of preparation for unregulated violence black people have come up with to survive it. So the lyric is basically saying, your mama may be fine, but I want you to keep in mind that this kind of unexpected possibility can happen. So the extraction process makes this very difficult. It makes it almost invisible and, 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 and actually subordinates that cultural context from what matters. And so I want, I want to encourage us, and, and you know, many of you in here are deep blues experts, and so I'm not a fool. I'm not going to sit here and try to give you, you know, the knowledge on the blues. That's what you're here for. What I'm trying to contribute here is a bigger understanding about how to put the blues in the context of American race relations and to remind us that we are not out of the woods. We're actually pretending that we never were in the woods. We think we're on a concrete patio, but we're completely in the deepest forest there is and that we're not going to get out until we grapple with it. And that means to love the blues not just either as a blind extraction project and also not to love the blues in a grasping, rigid way to say it has to be this or it's nothing and it has to belong only to me this way or it's nothing, but to remember the love ethic and the gift giving of the blues but also keep in mind that if black suffering as its point of origin, as its logic, as its organizing principle is not at the heart of that love, then it's the wrong kind of love. And it's a love that will not free us. Thank you very much.